should have said in accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for members' statements has uh, concluded. Questions without notice. The member for Wakefield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Despite the fact his deputy has admitted he was a citizen of a foreign uh, power right up until the weekend, the Prime Minister has spent all week fighting to keep his own job, which relies on a one-seat majority that his deputy provides. What is the Prime Minister's response to factory workers in Elizabeth in my electorate, who every day watch this Prime Minister do absolutely everything to protect his job and nothing to protect theirs? The member for Barker. Members on my right, the member for Barker is warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank the honourable member for his question. And Mr. Speaker, the greatest threat to the jobs of the workers in the honourable member's electorate in South Australia is the highest and least reliable energy in Australia. Nothing has done more to undermine the jobs of factory workers and manufacturing workers in South Australia than the high prices of energy and the unreliability of that energy in the honourable member's state. And he knows that is a direct consequence of what the Labor Premier Jay Wetherill described as his great experiment. I'll tell you what he was experimenting with. I'll tell the member for Wakefield what, it, what Jay Wetherill was experimenting with, the lives of his constituents, their livings, their jobs, their futures. What prospect do you have? What prospect do you have in a competitive world in a state which has the most expensive, the least reliable energy in the OECD? Well, I'm glad the honourable members given me the opportunity to respond to this, because unlike his party, we have policies and plans for energy that will ensure that energy is reliable and that prices are lower. What was, South, what was Labor doing about the price of gas? What was Labor doing? Nothing. They weren't thinking anything. They allowed, they allowed huge export facilities to be built for gas from the East Coast and were warned in 2012 by their own energy department and AEMO that this was going to put pressure on the domestic market. It's all there in black and white. The honourable member for Port Adelaide knows all about it. They were given that warning. They ignored it. They did nothing. And as a result, we had a domestic gas market that was short of supply. Prices went through the roof. Electricity prices went up. The firming power that a state like South Australia desperately needed, so dependent on, on wind, so dependent on intermittent renewables, they needed gas peakers more than anyone, but of course they couldn't afford to run them, and they were closed too. And so you got the colossal failure of Labor policy in South Australia. So I'd say this to the honourable member: the message he can take to his constituents that he asked about from me is this: we are standing up for them. We are not letting them down like Labor did. We are determined to ensure that they have competitive and reliable energy that will enable investment and the jobs that follow in his electorate and right across the nation. Members on my right, the member for Banks. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on how the government delivers on its commitments in an open and transparent manner? Is the Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Mr Speaker, the government has made a series of commitments to the Australian people, and we are delivering on every single one of them, openly, transparently and honestly. We promised to deliver real reform to education. We did. And we are delivering for the first time in the history of the Commonwealth transparent, consistent national needs based funding. Something Labor talked about but never delivered. Something the Labor praised David Gonski for recommending but then ignored, and we have delivered that. We promised to cut taxes for small and medium businesses directly assisting millions of Australians across the country. And we have delivered on that. 
and we have more to go. We promised to grow the economy and create jobs, and we are delivering. Jobs and growth is not just a slogan, it is an outcome. It is an outcome. With Mr Speaker, around 240,000 new jobs have been added in the last 12 months alone. Mr Speaker, we promised to return the rule of law to Australia's building and construction sector. And we, we, had, we had the metal and the courage to prorogue the parliament, bring it back, ensure the Senate rejected the ABCC bill a second time, dissolve both houses, call a double dissolution, come back here, and that is now law, delivered law. And we brought it bringing an end to the CFMEU's thuggery and lawlessness. And we've promised to fully fund the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and that legislation to deliver that has been introduced into the House today. And that will provide, Mr Speaker, Australians with a disability with the certainty of funding to which they are entitled. Certainty for 460,000 Australians with a severe and permanent disability will now be able to live their lives with dignity thanks to that scheme and know that the money is there. Parents of children with disability will know that the funding will be there for their children after they are no longer there. This is providing a security and integrity that Labor failed to deliver. We are delivering that, and we call on Labor once again to back this reform in, because the NDIS deserves to be fully funded. <clears throat> and Mr Speaker, the con by contrast, you look at the Leader of the Opposition. He has been, what has he opposed lately? It's a long list. He has opposed in the Senate and in this House legislation which does no more than stop businesses paying corrupting benefits to unions. He has opposed transparency and he's opposed the integrity. Prime Minister's time you wouldn't has think concluded. You the Prime Minister's time has concluded. The member for Lindsay. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Shop assistants working in Penrith Plaza had their penalty rates cut on July 1 after this House voted with a majority of just one. Does this Prime Minister acknowledge that his decision to accept his deputy's vote when it may have been unconstitutional for him to even be here is having a real impact on every Australian? The Prime Minister has the call. Now, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The honourable member's constituents should be very pleased that our party is in government and not hers. The honourable member's party has no plans for jobs or economic growth at all. The honourable member's party has led by a man who was asked on the ABC, what is your plan for economic growth? He couldn't think of one. And then he thought, he said, we're in favour of public transport. That was, Mr Speaker, that was his response. He couldn't say, as he used to in the old, the old bill days, he couldn't say, oh, I'm in favour of cutting the, business the taxes. The Prime Minister will because, refer to members by their correct titles. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I will do so. He couldn't do that in his previous incarnation as a minister in the Gillard government. When he used to say, I know, everyone knows, he said, it's, he said every student of economic history in Australia, like him, great student he is, he's a great student, he's read all those books, very knowledgeable, and he said every student of economic history knows that the way to create investment is to lower business taxes, and that's why we're doing it. And he gave speech after speech, even speeches that were the hitherto unknown. The Prime Minister will resume but, his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. The member for Lindsay, under direct relevance, yes. the member for Lindsay has raised an issue of pay cuts for people working at Penrith Plaza, and the Prime Minister should be relevant to it. The Prime Minister has the yeah, call. Well, Mr. 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 Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the honourable members, the honourable member has asked about pay at Penrith Plaza. Let me tell the honourable member. The drivers of economic growth in Penrith and everywhere else in the country are investment, and that is what drives jobs. More investment, more jobs. More people have an income, more people go shopping at Penrith Plaza. The idea that a policy-free zone 
the Labor Party, dripping with nothing more than, than envy and malice, is going to deliver jobs in Penrith Plaza or anywhere else is very naive. Envy, bitterness, malice is not going to get people hard in Penrith, Parley, in Penrith Plaza. What that needs is investment, confidence and employment. 240,000 new jobs over the last year. That's what's being delivered. Strong investment, getting stronger, supported by the government, supported by policies that back in growth and will ensure that the constituents of the honourable member will have a greater opportunity under the leadership we're providing than under the envious bitterness of the Labor Party. Just before I call the member for Petrie, I again caution members who are interjecting continuously, particularly those who have been asked to leave under Standing Order 94A and asked to leave on a number of occasions. The member for Griffith is in that category, as is the member for Bruce. I'm just saying very calmly, even though it's loud, I'm not going to reciprocate uh, with loud responses. I'm going to reciprocate with action to remove them from the chamber. And for those who have been removed a number of times, uh, they can expect more severe action. If that's what they want to happen during question time, I'll be left with no choice. The member for Petrie has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer please update the House on the latest employment figures and the action that the government is taking to grow our economy to support more and better paid jobs? Better Treasurer, are you aware of any alternative approaches? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Petrie for his question. And the second part of his question is, are, am I aware of any alternative approaches to growing jobs in this country, Mr Speaker, apart from the ones being pursued by the government? And the answer to that is no, because those opposite do not have a plan to create jobs, Mr Speaker. What they have is a plan for envy, Mr Speaker. What they have is a plan, a plan Mr Speaker, to deceive the Australian people by this shifty leader of the opposition, Mr Speaker. He was shifty as a union official and he's been as shifty as a leader of the opposition as well. On this side of the House, we have a plan that we are implementing to create jobs in this country and we're getting results. Some 240,000 jobs were created in the last financial year. That is the highest rate of jobs growth we've seen in a full financial year since before Member for the global Bendigo. financial crisis. But today's data reveals the strongest six-month growth in full-time jobs in 40 years, Mr Speaker. The strongest growth in full-time jobs in 40 years, the entire period in which the Labor Force survey has been run, Mr Speaker. 210,800 full-time jobs created in the past six months, Mr Speaker. That is a fact. That is not a slogan, it's a fact, Mr Speaker. And during the same period, some 36,000 young people got jobs, and in the most recent data that came down today, the youth unemployment rate also fell, as indeed the overall unemployment rate fell to 5.6 per cent. But not just that, Mr Speaker. Over that last six months, we have seen more Australians joining the labour force the confidence to go out and get a job in this economy. More than 200,000 Australians have joined the Australian Labor Force in the last six months. Jobs growth uh, through the year is now at 2 per cent. That is 10 times the rate that we inherited from the job thieves on that side of the parliament, Mr Speaker. 2 per cent, 10 times the rate of growth, and some 736,000 jobs have been created in the less than four years since we were first elected. An average uh, weekly ordinary term earnings over the year, Mr Speaker, is now at more than 80,000. And that means, that means that the tax cuts delivered by the Turnbull government, that means if you're on the average ordinary full-time earnings, you are not on the second highest tax bracket as a result of the tax cuts delivered by the Turnbull government. The Turnbull government, Mr Speaker, equals jobs. 
Simple and fair as that, Mr Speaker. It means more jobs for Australians, some 200,000 plus jobs full time created in the last six months. That's our record the of action. The Treasurer's time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. After all the stories of banking scandals, the thousands of victims, life savings gone, homes lost, businesses gone under, the Australian people want a royal commission into the banks. But the government has been using its one-seat majority to protect the banks from a banking royal commission. How can the Prime Minister continue to accept the vote of the Deputy Prime Minister when it means that the victims of banking scandals are denied the royal commission they deserve? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker the opposition has proposed a banking royal commission for some time, and they they have said they they've expressed this on the basis that they feel it is a way of getting at the banks. Now, Mr. Speaker, the object the object of our policies and everyone's policies should be to ensure that banks look after their customers, and where their customers have been mistreated, justice is done. That's the difference. Every policy we have introduced <laughs> since the election relating to banks delivers greater protections, great justice for their customers. Now, you can see that our institutions are working. You look at the, the uh, money laundering uh, allegations relating to the Commonwealth Bank, they are uncovered by Austrac, they have proceedings have been commenced. They will be before the courts, I believe, on the 4th of September, very shortly. Member for what you have is institutions that are working. The Treasurer and the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services have put in place a new one-stop shop for people that have had the, been, been uh, mistreated or dealt with unfairly by the banks so they can get justice. A royal, royal commissions have their uses and their values. But at the end of the day, they cannot recompense one person. They cannot, they cannot provide any compensation. All they can do is inquire and, at the end of a long period, inevitably write a report with recommendations. And I'd ask the honourable members to reflect on this. What would the recommendations of such an inquiry be? You would find that, you would find that those, rec those obvious recommendations are already being implemented by a government that acts, by a government that protects depositors, that protects borrowers right now. That's our commitment. We are delivering on our commitment to protect the, the customers of the Australian banks. We're holding them to higher levels of accountability than they've ever been held before. We're getting on with that job. More resources to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to ASIC and to Austrac, ensuring that our regulators do their job. Customers, Australians, want justice now. That's our focus, not on a political outcome. Just before I call the member for Denison, I just want to inform the House we have present in the gallery this afternoon Mr Barry Hass, the former member for Durack. Uh, on behalf of the House, a warm welcome. And I'm also advised we have uh, in the gallery uh, Mr Chris Minnis, MP, the member for Cogra in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, on behalf of the House. A warm welcome. The member for Denison has the call. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in a dreadful development, Cadbury is sacking 50 workers at its Claremont factory. The simple fact is that the factory would not be downsizing if the coalition government had delivered on its 2013 <coughs> promise to inject $16 million of economic stimulus into the northern suburbs of Hobart through enhancements to the factory. Instead, when Cadbury didn't go ahead with a new visitor centre, the government took the money from the battlers in my electorate and used it elsewhere as a political slush fund. Prime Minister, what will you do to return that stimulus money to Denison? What will you do to help the 50 sacked workers? The Prime yeah. Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. And, uh, and like him, we were very sad and disappointed to see the reports today of the job losses at Cadbury's Claremont plant. But the honourable member's uh, his historical account uh, is one from which I must differ. The, the coalition 
pledged $16 million to upgrades at Cadbury's uh, Tasmanian plant in the lead up to the 2013 election. That is so. But it is also a matter of public record that Cadbury subsequently withdrew its application for those federal government funds. And the funds were then redirected to a Tasmanian jobs and investment fund. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, this is a uh, obviously, the decision that's been taken is a commercial matter for Cadbury's parent company, Mondelez, but we understand that these, decision, these decisions uh, significantly, grievously impact workers, their families and the local economy. We're making assistance available to affected workers through the Job Active Service, which is connecting job seekers with employers through a national network of providers in over 1,700 locations, the What's Next online resources and website. And the government is also committed to economic development and creating new jobs in Tasmania. Through the Tasmanian Jobs and Investment Fund, there are 56 business projects expected to create more than 700 new jobs in Tasmania. As the honourable member will recall, the $16 million of federal money was joined with $8 million of state government money to make a $24 million fund. Uh, we're also investing $25 million in the regional jobs and investment package for Tasmania, which is the Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Denison on a point of order. Um, uh, uh, speaker, just on relevance, I draw the Prime Minister's attention to the second part of the question about what we can do to help these 50 workers right the now. The member for Denison will resume his seat. Uh, the Prime Minister is being relevant. If there's more than if there's numbers of parts to the question, um, it's. Uh, a matter for uh, the minister answering the question uh, to address them as they will. The Prime well, Minister has Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I actually just a moment ago talked about assistance that is available immediately through federal government agencies and programs. But we are also investing $25 million in the Regional Jobs and Investment Package for Tasmania, which is now open for applications. We have committed the over $11.3 million for projects in Tasmania under Round 1 of the Building Better Regions Member Fund. For Franklin now, in the Hobart warned. area specifically, I would note uh, the Tasmania Jobs and Investment Fund is providing $137,000 to Ziggy's Supreme Small Goods, especially small goods retail outlet near Hobart, who were here in Canberra last night at the Taste of Tasmania function that I am sure many uh, honourable members attended, and a million dollars to one atmosphere. Uh, towards defence equipment manufacturing southeast of Hobart, and that's just to name a few. We are boosting investment and generating jobs in Tasmania, right across Tasmania, just as we are right across the nation. The member for Durack. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Industry, representing the Minister for Employment. Will the minister outline to the House why it's important that leaders of unions and employer organisations always act in the best interests of their members and disclose to their members any potential or actual conflicts of interest? Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Defence Industry representing the Minister for Employment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Durack for her question. Mr Speaker, it is critical that union members have confidence that their leaders are always beyond reproach and are acting in the interests of union members and making sure that the rules are being followed, Mr Speaker. It's always funny how the opposition spins around and shows me his back when it's a shifty tactic. It's one of those shifty tactics, Mr Speaker, that shifty people would use, Mr Speaker. But it's very important that, uh, that union members be able to have confidence in their leaders, that the rules are being followed, uh, that they're not having their money used for the personal purposes of their union leaders, Mr Speaker. So it does very much surprise this side of the House that in 2005 the Leader of the Opposition, when he was the National Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union, uh, gave $100,000 to the organisation GetUp in spite of also being on the board of GetUp. So he was on the board of GetUp, he was also the National Secretary, and he gave $100,000 to GetUp. One wonders why he won't show us the minutes which indicated that this was agreed to by the national executive and whether he declared his conflict of interest. A couple of years later, Mr Speaker, in 2007, Australian Super 
donated $27,000 to the Australian Workers Union when the Leader of the Opposition again was on the board of Australian Super and National Secretary of the Australian Workers Union. But we also get the trifecta because he was also the Labor candidate for Maribyrnong at the same time. And coincidentally, coincidentally, the Australian Workers Union then employed a campaign worker in Maribyrnong who was paid $26,000 for her work, which seems like a very similar number. Now, Mr Speaker, we hear that in 2007, the pièce de résistance was the Leader of the Opposition is very interested in what the member for Sydney is talking about. They're probably trying to decide the capital of Africa or talking about their African language as their lessons, Mr Speaker. In 2007, we discover that when the Leader of the Opposition was the National Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union, that union gave $25,000 to his Maribyrnong campaign, Mr Speaker. So he didn't even bother with a third party. He cut out the middleman, Mr Speaker. He cut out the middleman and gave the $25,000 straight to the Maribyrnong campaign when he was the National Secretary of the AWU. Now, he's been asked a lot of questions about this. He's been asked about it. Today he said, today he said Mr Speaker, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of every issue. No, no, we don't want him to, Mr Speaker. We don't want him to go into the ins and outs of every issue. We just want him to answer the question he was asked. Did he authorise a $25,000 union the donation when he was the Secretary concluded. of the AWU? Members on both sides. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank court. you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, it's now day four since Australia learned that the Deputy Prime Minister was also a citizen of a foreign power. Will the Prime Minister acknowledge that the Deputy Prime Minister's position is unsustainable? The Deputy Can Prime Minister will cease interjecting. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The, Prime, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister will cease interjecting. Members on my left will cease interjecting. I think it would be better if the Leader of the Opposition began his question. Again. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, it's now four days since Australia discovered that the Deputy Prime Minister is also the citizen of a foreign power. Will the Prime Minister acknowledge that the situation of his Deputy Prime Minister is unsustainable and consistent with Senator Canavan's precedent? When will the Prime Minister make the Deputy Prime Minister stand aside and when will the government stop accepting his vote? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When will the Leader of the Opposition Tell Member us for why Isaacs he is gave 100,000 of AWU workers' money to get up. When will he tell us why he funded, why he funded his own election campaign? When will he fess up? The, the Prime Minister will resume his seat. Has... The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Prime Minister. Has the Prime Minister concluded his answer? The member for Bonner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Will the Minister update the House on benefits to all Australians of a well-managed national security agenda? Why is it important to maintain strong and consistent border protection policies? And is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Well, Mr. Uh, Speaker, thank you very much uh, to the member for Bonner for his question. Thank him very much uh, for his concerted effort in making sure that our country can keep the boat stopped and make sure that the people smugglers don't get back into business. I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Speaker. If this man here, this leader of the opposition, had a one-seat majority in this place, the boats would be coming like an armada across the seas. There's no question about that, Mr. Speaker. Without the one-seat majority on this side, the Labor Party would still be presiding 
over 1,200 deaths at sea. The I can tell Minister you one thing, Mr. Speaker. And border protection. We'll just pause for a second. The member for Burt will leave under 94A. The member for Burt will leave under 94A. The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection has the Mr. Thought. Speaker, the Australian the public, for Jelly Brand will leave the Australian public should be in no doubt whatsoever that if this leader of the opposition was Prime Minister of this country, if they had a one-seat majority in this House, there would be another 17 detention centres open, another 8,000 children put into detention, because that is what happened when Labor was last in government. That's the reality, Mr. Speaker, when you have a leader as we've got in this leader of the opposition that has no ability no ability to stare down the left of his party no ability to deal with the threats at our borders no ability to deal with the very serious threat of national security and why do people say about this leader of the opposition that he's shifty and that he's shonky and that he's shady because he's been at the center of every shady shonky and shifty deal when he was leader of the opposition when he was leader of the union movement and let me say, Mr Speaker, if people don't know where this Leader of the Opposition stands in relation to this very important issue, it's because of the positions that he has adopted over a long period of time, including when he was a founding director of GetUp. Now, the Australian public knows GetUp is a front for the Labor Party and for the Australian Greens. The CFMEU gave it a million dollars last year. When he was the AWU secretary, he gave it $100,000 without authority. And what is their opinion when it comes to this issue of stopping boats? They're running this dodgy, shifty campaign at the moment to bring them here. That is to bring people from Manus and Nauru here. We know if they did that, the boats would recommence. So no wonder people are confused about this leader of the opposition and whether he could lay, in str lay straight in bed, because when he was financially propping up get up he was supporting policies which would see people drown at sea again would see people in detention would see thousands of children coming by boat and yet now when he's in this position and he wants to be prime minister of this country he is asking the australian public to believe something very different what the australian public know not only about this leader being shifty and shonky they know that he can't hold a story for more than 24 hours. And that's the problem with this Leader of the Opposition. This Leader of the Opposition has been called out by the Australian public because they know, like many the others in this place, that he. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister and refers to his failure to answer the previous question. Does the Prime Minister actually believe that what's happened this week with his deputy is sustainable? Does he believe that he'll be able to continue to go on without asking the Deputy Prime Minister to stand aside? And when will the government stop accepting his vote? Yeah. The Prime Minister well, has thank the Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question, which is uh, he's asked in many forms during the course of the week, and I refer him to my earlier answers. The member for Calair. Member for Calair has the call. Member for Calair has the call. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Agriculture, Water Resources, Resources in Northern Australia. The member for Calair will begin his question again. There will be no interjections or members will be ejected from the chamber. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Agriculture, Water Resources, Resources in Northern Australia. Will the Deputy Prime Minister outline to the House how the government is encouraging growth delivering jobs and building resilience in regional communities, particularly in my electorate of Calair. Is he aware of any threats to our plan to drive economic development in regional Australia? Question. The Deputy Prime Minister. The member for Wakefield will leave under 94A. Thank you very much. I thank, well, I thank the honourable member for his question, Deputy the Speaker. The uh, Deputy Prime Minister I will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Not on a point of order. I yep. move that he be no longer heard. Yeah. The Manager of Opposition Business has moved that the Deputy Prime Minister be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. no. 
I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is the Deputy Prime Minister be no further heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes for the left. I appoint the honourable members for Lawler and Morton. Tell us for the ayes and the honourable members for Gray and Murray. Tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 64, noes 74. The question is therefore negatived. Just, just wait. We'll just wait till everyone takes their seat and. That's because the clock hadn't started. No, the clock had not started. I take a point of order. The manager of opposition business wishes to take a point of order. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The resolution that I just moved that the House has now voted on mm. was not moved until the Deputy Prime Minister had commenced his answer. And well, yet, and yet, I'm being told that the clock hadn't started. The clock has to start at the commencement of the answer. I didn't move a resolution until the answer had commenced. Therefore, the clock should now have run I, down. He'd, well, look, if you, if you want to play this game, and I no, li listen, we had this the other day. The, the member had started to commence his answer. If he wants the clock set at two minutes and 58 seconds, we can do it. Now, you raised the other day the prospect that this was the first time the clock hadn't had stopped during the answer. And I undertook to the member then, I said to the best of my recollection, there had been instances where when such a motion was put on a minister in question time that the clock had stopped. I checked. I put two examples to the House. 21 October 2010, when Minister Crean had such a motion put, and he recommenced the answer because the clock stopped. And a week later, on the 28th of October, similarly on then Prime Minister Gillard. Now, if the manager of opposition business's point is that the clock had started, it had started by a couple of seconds. So what do you want to set it at? Two minutes and 55? Good. Well, let's do that. Two minutes and 55. <laughs> and, and the Deputy Prime Minister. Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And today we have yet another great example of delivery. Another great example because today we said we got through this house a four billion dollar the start of a four billion dollar regional investment corporation to be based, to be based in Orange. Yet another sense, another sign of our decentralisation plan, a plan that we have for delivery of a greater standard of living for people in regional areas, just like our plan and our money that we've put on the table for the inland rail to create a corridor of commerce from Melbourne up to Brisbane, through Seymour, through Wodonga, to increase the economic activity and the boom for places such as Parks, for Narrabri, for Moree, for Gundawindi, for, for Toowoomba. This is our plan. And of course, we also, the plan goes on with decentralisation. APVMA up to Armadale, ready to get down to Wagga, GRDC to Toowoomba, uh, moving, moving sections of MDBA down to Wodonga. We have a plan for regional Australia, but who, and we have dams, dams that we wish to build, dams such as Rookwood Weir. But all these things have one thing in common, and that is that the Labor Party does not believe in it. The Labor Party does not believe in the Regional Investment Corporation. The Labor Party does not believe in the Inland Rail. The Labor Party does not believe in regional development. The Labor Party was the party that shut down the live cattle trade. The Labor Party does not stand beside the coal miners of the Hunter Valley, does not believe in the coal miners of the Hunter Valley. The member for Shortland and the member for Hunter do not have the ticker to stand up in the Labor Party for those who work, for the labourers, for the labourers. They have given up on the labourers. It is, it is obviously a clear case that we believe the in the— Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. Members who are— Mem Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. Members who are— Standing around talking, obstructing the House deliberately will resume their seats or leave the chamber. They'll do so. The Leader of the Opposition included. The 
Member for Grindler on a point of order. Yeah, yes, Mr. Speaker. It, it almost makes No, the up... member for Grindler can resume his seat. I'll hear his point of order when members resume their seats or leave the chamber. Oh, you're in the hands of the member for McEwen at the moment. <laughs> The member for Grindler on a point of order. Yes, yes, Mr. Speaker. It's really consistent with the rulings that you've just made. It's normally the case that valedictories are heard in silence. The <laughs> member for Grindler will leave under 94A. <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is certainly his valedictory. It's certainly his valedictory. He's gone. So it's very important that we understand that the depreciation allowances has allowed a boom for the construction of grain sheds in the seat of parks. This is the difference a good government makes, and it's reflected in the fact that agriculture has seen a 30 per cent increase, increase in, its, in, in its output since we have been the government. Now, all we need from the Labor Party is a belief in regional Australia, something that says that they actually are going to construct for regional Australia, something that actually they are going to stand behind. They won't stand beside the coal miners. They don't believe in the coal miners. They don't believe in coal fire power. They don't believe in the inland rail. They don't believe in the regional investment corporation. They don't believe in dams and places such as Brookwood Weir. There is nothing that they are offering regional Australia. They are completely vacant of regional Australia, except in their incessant belief in playing parlour games. But it was so comforting last night when we see eight out of eight and in the box pop in my town in Tamworth. The one thing they can't stand the is shiftiness, and that's why they won't support the Labor Party. Concluded. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that so much of the standing and session of orders be suspended as would prevent the Manager of Opposition Business from moving the following motion immediately. That the House won notes that the House unanimously asks the High Court to determine whether the Deputy Prime Minister is constitutionally qualified to be a Member of Parliament and therefore to determine if the government has a majority. B. The Deputy Prime Minister has admitted he was a citizen of a foreign power right up until the weekend and has already started campaigning for the New England by-election. C. Former Minister Matt Canavan has resigned from Cabinet and will not vote in the Senate until the High Court resolves doubts about his constitutional qualifications. D. The Prime Minister is continuing to accept the Deputy Prime Minister's vote in this House, even though it means that victims of the banks are denied the Royal Commission they have been calling for and Australians continue to have their penalty rates cut. And E. The situation with the Deputy Prime Minister is unsustainable. And yeah. two, Therefore, calls on the Prime Minister to a admit his continued reliance on the Deputy Prime Minister's vote is causing real harm to the people of Australia. B. Rule out accepting the vote of the Deputy Prime Minister while his constitutional qualifications are in doubt. And C. Direct the Deputy Prime Minister to immediately resign from Cabinet. The Prime Minister told the truth today when he said he was transparent. When the Prime Minister said he was transparent, he was spot on. Because no one has missed the transparency of a Prime Minister who will do and say anything to cling to office. This is an illegitimate government throwing a tantrum. And as they throw a tantrum and throw the toys in every direction, they don't care. They don't care who they contradict, even when it's themselves. They're willing to jeopardise a relationship and create a a new international incident with New Zealand. They're willing to jeopardise arguments they made as recently as Monday. They're willing to undo the arguments that they made when Senator Kenavan resigned. And they're willing to completely undo the arguments that they put in place when the Greens' resignations took place. You see, the thing with this Prime Minister, the Prime Minister will probably get up later in the House and he'll be very passionate. But in order to believe what the Prime Minister says today, you have to ignore what he said last week. And this issue is exactly the same as everything we get from this Prime Minister. Issue after issue, no matter how much passion he brings to the table, you can only believe what he says today if you ignore what he used to say. It's not long ago, it's not long ago that we heard it was incredible sloppiness on the part of the Green Party. 
that administratively just how hopeless they were. Could the manager and of yes. opposition business just pause for a second? I don't want Edu in his time. Members on the government side, on my right, will resume their seats or leave the chamber. The treasurer. The manager of opposition business. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. In terms of what happened when the Green Party resigned, the arguments from the government then, if you want to believe those arguments are right, then their defence of the Deputy Prime Minister can't be right. Because they're the defence of the Deputy Prime Minister now is, oh, he didn't know. He had no way of knowing. And so if that argument's right, then every criticism they made about the Green Party is completely wrong. The arguments that they put in terms of the responsibility of Senator Canavan and whether Senator Canavan had done the right thing. If he did the right thing, and they argued it passionately then that he was doing the right thing, then everything the Deputy Prime Minister is doing now is completely wrong. But we'll hear passionately now. We'll hear the Prime Minister argue with the same level of passion as to why his deputy is doing the right thing now, with the exact opposite argument to what he put when Senator Canavan decided to step aside and not vote. But of all the arguments, of all the arguments that this government has been willing to put, nothing has been more bizarre than their conspiracy theories. It's interesting today. No Dixer from the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I was ready to move the extension of time. I was ready to move the extension of time. But the opportunity just wasn't there. Because instead of looking like Sherlock Holmes uncovering the conspiracy, it was the school prefect saying, how dare you dob on us? That was the argument they wanted to put. They were, they were like that final scene of Scooby-Doo when they say, oh, we would have got away with it too if it wasn't for you meddling kids. Because, because what they put forward and their entire defence here, the whole conspiracy theory is based on the fact that they didn't think they'd get found out. And that's what they're upset about, that the Deputy Prime Minister has been willing to go through the entirety of his parliamentary career in, in breach on the face of it of Australia's constitution. And their objection, their anger, the conspiracy is somebody worked it out. Somebody worked out that maybe this government with a majority of one was in fact a minority government. Somebody worked out that when they were ridiculing the Greens, not, it's not just some anonymous backbencher who was, who was guilty of doing the same thing. It was the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. What those opposite don't seem to understand, but a lot of their backbench from Phil Curry's article have worked it out, which is simply this. What they have done this week is not sustainable. Everybody knows if they let this two-week break go, and Parliament comes back on the 4th of September, do they really think we will have moved on? Do they really think the Australian people will suddenly be OK with the concept that every time there's a vote in this House, we don't know if it's a legitimate majority? Every time the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia stands up, we don't know if he's legally in office. When the Prime Minister goes overseas, Australia will be the only country in the world being run by someone where their own country doesn't know whether he's legally allowed to do the job. That's the situation and the embarrassment that this Prime Minister is willing to put us in. And I've got to say, you wouldn't need much authority when the evidence is this strong. You wouldn't need much authority to say, Deputy, you've got to stand aside. If the High Court clears you, you'll come back. It wouldn't take much authority to do that. How little authority does this Prime Minister have that he can't even, in the face of the court of the House unanimously referring the matter to the High Court, he can't even say that to his deputy? All he can do is look down the barrel of a camera and say, oh, I'm a really strong leader. Oh, I'm a really, really strong leader. Strong leaders don't need to say that, Prime Minister. Strong leaders don't need to make comments like that. But you don't need to be a terribly strong leader to say, if we don't know whether or not we're governing legally, maybe we ought to ask him to stand aside. That's not an unreasonable position for the government to arrive at. But this Prime Minister has so little authority, he cannot even bring it to that. And they'll want to argue, 
They will want to argue that somehow this is a matter only within the Canberra bubble that doesn't have an impact on the real life consequences of Australians. Well, tell that, tell that to the victims of the banks when they get denied a royal commission in this place by one vote. Tell that to the shop assistants who the Prime Minister dismissed at Penrith Plaza, saying, oh, no, trickle down economics will work for them. They'll get jobs. They've got jobs. The problem is they had a pay cut. And the reason they've had a pay cut was one vote. One vote. One vote from Member some of the Karanga lowest paid workers in this country getting a pay cut or having their conditions protected. And it was the one vote of the Deputy Prime Minister that may well have been unlawful. The Prime Minister might like to think this issue will drift off because the media cycle will move on. I say to the Prime Minister, just stop and think about the gravity of what we are talking about this week. They only have a majority of one, and we have unanimously voted to the High Court that we don't know whether that majority is lawful. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. And this doesn't require much leadership to be able to move on. And if the people behind the Prime Minister have given him so little authority that he can't even direct a member of his front bench who might be there unlawfully to step aside for a couple of months, then why are you keeping him there? If you won't give the Prime Minister enough authority to make a simple decision like that, then, then make the move that the member for Warringah is beckoning on. Because if there was any stability on those behind him, there would be stability in this parliament. And there is not. The government at least last week thought, oh, maybe this week they'll get a diversion from the postal vote. Maybe they'll get a diversion from the postal survey. Well, they got it. They got the diversion they were looking for. And the entire legitimacy of this government is called in question, and those opposite in the front row might not have worked it out, but the Australian the people have, of and those behind them have worked it out too. Concluded. Is the motion seconded? It is, Mr Speaker. I second the motion, and I want to indicate at the House that I've agreed to give up some of my time to Mr Wilkie so he can make a contribution on behalf of the crossbench. This motion, uh, Mr Speaker, is one about ministerial responsibility. And it's about time this Deputy Prime Minister started to take some responsibility for his own action and action. When he was caught out doctoring his hand Mr Speaker, it was the fault of his staff. And when his departmental secretary tried to stand up for the staff, well, we know the history there. He was gone. When he, when he couldn't answer a question on the Channel 10's project, he first blamed the person doing the interview. When that didn't work, he again play, blamed his media adviser. Do we remember the hashtag, pray for Jake? Mr Speaker, when he, was, when he wouldn't move on the, prawn, uh, the white spot outbreak uh, in the prawn sector, it was the Queensland government's fault. When he introduced the, the backpack the attacks for, for the first again, time, the it was the day. Labor Party's fault. No, the member for Hunter, Mr. Speaker, well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, member for Hunter will cease speaking for a second. He needs to relate his... Uh, speech to why standing orders should be suspended, as the manager of opposition business did. The member for Hunter. I will, Mr. Speaker. Mm. Uh, this, uh, this motion is urgent because people out there in the community are watching on this parliament, and they see a, they are seeing a rabble. They are seeing a deputy prime minister who, by his own admission, is not uh, not validly sitting in this place. They're seeing a deputy prime minister and a minister for agriculture. There are big questions about his validity to sit in this place. They're watching a Minister for Agriculture, a Minister for Resources, a Minister for Northern Australia sitting in this place, and they're asking themselves how people in those constituencies, in those sectors, can take this minister seriously when there is such a black cloud hanging over his head. Now, Mr Speaker, already people are asking themselves about the capacity of this Deputy Prime Minister. In four years in that portfolio, he has not done one thing to help the mining and uh, the agriculture community and people in the mining and other sectors that he has now picked now have a, a very low expectation about his capacity to do any more. They need to explain, Mr Speaker, again, what is the difference between the case of Senator Canavan and the case of the, the current member for New England. I cannot understand why the Prime Minister Having heard the Minister for Agriculture admit himself that uh, he, he's a goner in the High Court, he's, he's, cooked, 
He's kicked off his campaign in New England. And I say to you, Prime Minister, if he's accepting his demise, it's time you accepted it. We thought we might have better than uh, we might hear better from the Prime Minister. We thought he might take some responsibility. He has form in not taking responsibility. His failed MBN project is a perfect example. But we would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that as a Prime Minister of this country, someone holding such high office would stand up and take responsibility for the actions of the Deputy Prime Minister. It's everyone else's fault but the fault of the Deputy Prime Minister. It's, the New, it's New Zealand's fault. It's the Labor Party's fault. It's anyone's fault but the, the fault of the Deputy Prime Minister. He has a responsibility to his constituents, Mr Speaker. He has a responsibility as Deputy Prime Minister to the, to the electorate more broadly to concede, to admit, to accept, to take responsibility for his own actions and inactions and step aside both from his portfolio responsibilities and to step aside from his right to vote in this place until the High Court has come to a conclusion, has come to a conclusion on the matter he himself, the matter his own government, not, not the Labor Party, not the opposition, but his own government has referred to the High Court. His own government has referred to the High Court. So it's time, Deputy Prime Members Minister, on my right. it's time for you for the first time in your 10 years in this place, remembering for 10 years you have sat in this place with a big question mark hanging over your head, it's time you took responsibility for your own actions and indeed inactions. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The call needs to go to this side next. The question is the motion. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. The member for Denison has a call. Uh, speaker, on indulgence, if I could just very briefly speak uh, on behalf of the member for Indi and the member for Mayo and explain why we have been abstaining this week on this and similar motions. We agree that the member for New England would be better to step aside from Cabinet and the position of Deputy Prime Minister until this matter is resolved. However, we cannot uh, support a move uh, that his vote does not count because, frankly, until the High Court has decided this matter, he has been elected. The people of New England deserve to be represented, and it's proper to accept uh, his vote. I think we should pay respect to the High Court, allow the High Court to adjudicate this matter, and then that will be finalised. And in the interim, why don't we all just get back to work and focus on the issues that everyone in this country is concerned about, like health and education uh, and jobs, and stop this, stop this fractious juvenile debate, which has disrupted every question time this week. It has not been in the public interest. We know there's an issue. We know it's an important issue. We agree on this side, and most of the crossbench agree that the member for New England would be better to step aside from the cabinet and the position of the deputy prime minister. But please, let's respect the High Court and let them adjudicate whether or not his vote should be counted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The prime minister. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the member for Denison and I agree on the fundamental point that the member for New England is entitled to sit in this House. He is a member of parliament. Yeah. And, he, and as long as he is a member of parliament, he is entitled to be a minister of state under the constitution. And so, so I acknowledge, I acknowledge, and we, we acknowledge the advice from the member for Denison, but the, the member fact for of the matter is this. The fact of the matter is this. The member for New England is entitled to sit in this House. The reference to the High Court was not done for any reason other than to give the court the opportunity to clarify this area of the law which has been the subject of so much controversy recently. And I agree with the member for Denison when he says we should be focusing on the issues of vital importance to Australia. And that is why this motion should not be supported. Mr Speaker, just in the last six weeks. This is what the government has been doing to keep Australians safe. We've gone to the G20 and secured the support of the 20 leading economies to take action to counter terrorism right across the world, to take action to ensure that the internet is not used to promote terrorism and spread extremism, to take action to ensure that the big tech companies and social media companies cooperate. Uh, with governments to ensure that we can track down and defeat those terrorists. And we have seen. I just Mr. ask the Prime Minister to pause for a second. As I said to the. These, I do give a lot of latitude in these debates, but it's important that 
the material relate to why standing orders should or should not be suspended. The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the point, the, 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 the matter that I'm addressing is the important issues that we are dealing with now, and the House should be dealing with, because the issue about uh, the Constitution is, as the member for Denison said, going to be considered by the High Court. But let me get back to the most important obligation of government, which is keeping Australians safe. It, just in the last few weeks, we saw the most dangerous, potent terrorist plot in our history disrupted and contained. We saw extraordinary work from ASIO, the Federal Police, the New South Wales Police, all of our agencies working together. Mr Speaker, this government, my government, has never been prouder of our agencies than we were when we saw them frustrate that plot, have those two men charged, knowing that their action, their professionalism, their courage has saved hundreds of lives. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have been working too to relieve the pressure on energy prices. We are taking action to bring down the price of gas simply by ensuring that Labor's failure of policy is not continued. And there will be, there will be adequate gas supplies on the East Coast. That is an urgent matter. That is an urgent matter the House could be debating. That is an urgent matter upon which we are acting. And of course, Mr Speaker, in the right now, in the here and now, so many, so many Australian families and businesses are paying more than they need to for electricity. That is very clear. They are on the wrong plan, they are on a plan, and then they expired. Nobody told them what was going to happen. They find themselves paying much higher rates. Literally millions of households are paying more for electricity than they need to. We have taken action, brought in the heads of the big electricity companies, and what they are doing is they are now contacting their customers and telling them of the opportunities to pay less for electricity. That is ensuring that Australian families who are feeling the pinch, who are struggling with higher costs, will have the opportunity to getting the information to get them on the right prices. And Mr Speaker, in the last 12 months, we have seen 240,000 new jobs created in Australia. The Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition talked about it being a jobless economy, no job growth. 240,000 new jobs are a lot of jobs. Believe me, the participation rate is high. We're seeing strong jobs growth. Now, what we're not seeing is we're not seeing enough growth in wages. And that is why we want to drive stronger economic growth. Because, Mr Speaker, let me tell you, let me tell you what will deliver higher wages higher economic growth and higher demand. And, the, and what the, uh, what the uh, Governor of the Reserve Bank said just uh, a few days ago, if labour markets are strong, workers will get bigger pay rises. Where there is strong demand relative to supply, wages will rise. There is very strong demand for some types of construction workers because of the infrastructure spending of this government. That's what's happening. We're spending money on infrastructure, $75 billion. So the governor acknowledges that there's demand there. He notes there's demand in some other areas, in IT, but we need stronger demand. What is going to give stronger demand? What is it? More investment. How do you get more investment? You reduce business taxes. They used to know that. That, uh, that cowardly fellow who always turns his back when things get a little uh, when things get a little uncomfortable he knows exactly what happened the prime but minister Mr. i'm sorry the prime minister will resume his seat the uh, member for McEwen. No, the prime oh, minister oh. withdraw that unparliamentary he remark. can't ask anyone to withdraw it wasn't directed at him i'm listening. The, the member for McEwen will not argue with me he's allowed to raise a point of order he can't ask people to withdraw i can and he can have a look at the practice on exactly how this occurs. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in the last six weeks also, we have passed laws to ban the practices of the Leader of the Opposition when he was running the AWU. 
all of the unaccountable, shifty conduct he used to get on with, taking money from big companies in order to trade away workers' penalty rights. That was what, that's what the opposition leader did when he was running the AWU. What about giving money to himself? What about giving money to himself? He talks about conflicts of interest. This is a union leader who, with union members' hard-earned funds, spent $25,000 on himself. He paid it to himself, to his own campaign. And you know, Mr Speaker, even worse in many respects, he took $32,000 from a building company with which he was negotiating an enterprise agreement. He didn't tell the members about that. Oh no. No, no. They were I tell you what, I tell you what, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, when he was running the AWU, always had his members on a need to know basis. And he thought they didn't need to know anything. He didn't need to know anything. He sold some mushroom workers down the river. He treated all of his members like mushrooms. He kept them in the dark and told them nothing. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, so we passed that law and the Labor Party voted against it. And what we've done also is ensure that unions will have to be accountable as companies are and transparent. Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of the Leader of the Opposition, he paid $100,000 to get up, hundred thousand dollars to get up. There is no evidence that it was authorised. We'd love to see the minute. It'd be good to see the minute, but it hasn't been produced. Hundred thousand to get up. Get up. Get up. Very relevantly this week. Get up. Only a few months ago, started a campaign to rename Australia Day Invasion Day. That's what. That's the organisation he was funding and on which he was a board member. Get up is prominent in campaigning to destroy Operation Sovereign Borders. Get up is the biggest campaigner, as joined by many members of the Labor Party, to open up our borders so that we would once again have thousands of unauthorised arrivals, drownings at sea, kids in detention. This is the shameful record of Labor, and the Leader of the Opposition funded a capable. Uh, a political organisation get up. They've got a big organisation. They, they get their message out. It is a dangerous left green Labor message. And they get it out there and they've been funded to do it by the Leader of the Opposition. And he can't walk away from that responsibility. So that's where the last six weeks we've been keeping Australians safe. We've been keeping looking, putting downward pressure on energy prices, and we've been growing the economy. Those are the urgent issues. That's what we should be debating. That's why this motion the should be Prime denied. Minister's time has concluded. Members on my right, and the time allotted for this debate has concluded. The question is that the motion, be, motion moved by the Manager of Opposition Business be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Manager of Opposition Business be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Lawler and Morton tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Gray and Murray tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 62, noes 72. The question is therefore negatived. <laughs> the Prime Minister. Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.